These are a few pointers I had put together about tires. You know, tires are probably one of the things that most people feel like they know enough about. And when I, first time I ever started fooling with tires as far as from a service perspective was when I was working at that gas station in 1975. And we had an old Coates machine that had one of those uh, slotted tools that you put on that screwdriver looking thing in the middle and uh, we would uh, mount and dismount tires with that. And that thing was doggone dangerous. If it uh, popped out of there while you were uh, trying to mount a tire or something, you know, which is an old wore out tire machine, and it slung that thing all the way across the shop. <laughs> it's a wonder it didn't knock somebody's head off, but occasionally we would have uh, issues, or, or, you know, it could have broken glass out of a car or something like that, because it was right there between the service bays. But um, there was a time when I was working at that place in Texas where we kept having to send tires to get them repaired at the uh, Michelin place uh, and we were down there on the coast in Sabine Pass and we would have to send them 15 miles to Port Arthur to get those tires repaired at Jack's Tire Service. That was the name of the place. And there was another tire place that my uh, supervisor favored that we didn't use it very much because it was way off up in Beaumont. It was like 30 miles away, 35 miles, whatever it was. And um, there was a guy that was selling one of those tire machines like I was really familiar with that I had worked with at the gas station and he only wanted a couple of hundred dollars for it. And so I told my supervisor, I said, we need to go ahead and get that tire machine so that we can fix these tires for these pickups and those case forklifts because they had a tire that would, you know, wheel tire and a wheel about like a a vehicle, uh, the rear ones, not the front ones, you know. And he says, no, we're not fooling with the tire machine. I said, well, what about these case forklifts? They're, you know, it's costing us a lot of money because they they have so many flats. We can't seem to keep them going. They're always sitting out there with a block under one side because the tires are always flat. He said, oh, I've already got a, a uh, solution for that. I'm going to have uh, Jerry White up there at White Tire make some, get some special rims and some aircraft retreads. Uh, for these things and then we won't have that problem with those flats anymore and so for, I said well what is that going to cost we had two of the case fork we have a bunch of Clarks and other you know heisters and other kinds we had but those were the ones we were focused on for the tire issue and he says well um, it'll be $250 a tire to do it well that was a thousand dollars this was 1979 I mean this is a long time ago and so I said well let's, let's see how that works out you know so we just kept you know, sending the, the girl that went to town every day on the van to pick up, you know, do all the business that needed to be done in town. She was a full-time job for her. She went twice a day to town, ran errands all over town. And uh, she would have to take those tires by Jack's tire, and they'd have to be fixed, and then she'd bring them back. And we, you know, we kept a bunch of spare tires on hand for all the Chevy pickups and Dodges that we had and all that. Point is, those aircraft retreads that he was talking about that were going to be so wonderful, uh, those things went flat a lot. I mean, they went flat just as much as the others. And the biggest problem with those is whenever we sent those, they were a lot heavier, a lot harder to change because the rims were made out of some real heavy stuff. And furthermore, we had to send those all the way to Beaumont to get them fixed, and they cost a lot more to fix. Well, I think eventually uh, they wound up filling those things up with polyurethane, or I mean with, uh, you know, whatever it was, with some kind of foam so that they would never go flat again. Uh, and that's probably what they should have done to start with instead of trying to get them to hold air. Anyway, but the experience that I had with that coach tire machine at that gas station, you know, made me confident that if he let, let me buy that $200 tire machine, which was chump change, uh, and put, put it in down there, we'd be able to fix tires ourselves. And it saved, it, we, the thing would have paid for itself in a week, you know, but it's flats that we had to have fixed and all. Anyway, here's a few pointers on tires after I rambled for a while. And so we're going to move on to the next one. Now, I had actually shown you this 88 Blazer that belonged to a student of mine. Uh, this tire over here that had thrown the tread and caused this thing to flip upside down looked exactly like that one right before the accident. And he had been driving. These tires looked so good, he felt like, shoot, I don't need tires. They were a lot older than 
then would have been safe, basically, you know, because whenever uh, this right here is the perfect example of what happens when a, on one of these uh, high center of gravity uh, blazers or, you know, old Broncos or whatever, and whenever it throws that tread off of there, you know, that thing's going to be turning over. Um, my Explorer and a, and a lot of the newer SUVs have basically, basically got a form of strut suspension to make the center of gravity lower in spite of the fact that the vehicle still looks like an old SUV. But even still, if it throws that rubber off like that one did, it's going to be a mess. Now what the deal is, uh, the tire warranty goes away after six years, but the tires become dangerous the closer you get to 10 years and beyond. Uh, personally, if a tire is expired, I don't like it on my vehicle. My wife has got a, a 2016 F-150 that only has about 7,000 miles on it, uh, but we bought it when it was brand new, and her tires are going to expire in 2022. That's this year. Uh, in spite of the fact that they're Michelin tires and they look really, really, really good, uh, you know, we might go a year or so after that, but they, they really need to be replaced. Uh, just because of the age of the tire. All right. So when the process of oxidation, you know, they don't always look this bad, but sometimes you can look at the tires pretty close and you'll see little uh, cracks on them and stuff like that. And you can't really go by the tread as much as you think you can on whatever it was the tire needs to be. Where there's oxygen, there's oxidation. Uh, of course, basically, O3 is three molecules of oxygen locked together and O3 is created every time lightning strikes. And if you want to see something kind of interesting, go to a lightning strike map right now, well, when you get through watching this video, and look at all of the, and it'll tell you every time there's a light, is a live lightning strike map. And it's astonishing how many lightning strikes are happening all the time, all over the place. And every time lightning strikes, it's creating ozone. Now your spark, plug spark creates ozone too and, and that's one of the reasons that, that ozone is extremely it's it's terrible to corrode things and to attack stuff that's prone to oxidize so anyway that's what goes with the tire and it doesn't matter how good tires look or where they were stored no warranty after six years dangerous after 10 years and because that process occurs so naturally it doesn't matter if the tire is being used or not or if it's being stored in a warehouse or whatever you know, if that date on that tire is over six years old, even if you just bought it yesterday, the warranty on that tire is no good as far as the uh, manufacturer is concerned. Okay, yeah, just about everybody that knows anything about tires knows how to look at all of this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Maximum permissible inflation pressure. I used to have students that would try to use that to determine how much air to put in a tire. Well, you don't go by what's stamped on the tire. That's your maximum pressure. What you're supposed to go by for that vehicle is the placard that's on the vehicle. More about that in a minute. But there, these numbers all mean something. There's all kinds of websites that you can go to that will tell you exactly how to, how to interpret all of the information that's on the tire and all that. The date code is really important. Although sometimes, whenever they mount the tires, they'll put the date code on the inside so you can't read it without getting under there on a creeper or something. And it's not stamped on both sides of most tires that I've seen anyway. Uh, sometimes the tire will be mounted so the date code will be on the inside of the tire. But this is the ninth week of 2018. That's not complicated. It's not difficult to figure out by glancing at that date how old that tire is and how close it is to being expired. All right, now stress factors on tires are inflation, pressure, load, speed. Now, if it's got too much or too little inflation pressure, that'll, you know, cause the tire to get, you know, some wear that it wouldn't ordinarily get. Load, speed, heat accelerates the point that the tires cause a failure. In hot southern states, like, in, you know, particularly in desert country and all that kind of stuff, it's really, really hard on tires because they're getting really, they're constant, they're, they're already hot anyway, and then they get even hotter when they're on the road. And... And you can see how if you're bending that rubber and those belts and all that stuff repeatedly, anything that you work over that much, or, you know, with a lot of low air pressure, it's going to be uh, it's going to be working that sidewall all the time, and you're going to have some issues. Now here's your uh, DOT identification right there. See, that's DOT right there. 
Uh, M5 is the plant code, DO is the optional code for size, uh, L8M is dimensional code, which is your sculpture, and then five, you know, 5008 is the you know, 50th week of 2008 on that one right there. You can tell where the tire was made if you know the code. You can do Google that uh, when you're looking at those numbers on the tires and figure out a lot of stuff. There are tires, incidentally, that when you look at the serial number on the tire, it will show up as a recall. And I had this uh, little app on my phone for a while, and for some reason that app doesn't work anymore now. I don't know if they took it down or whatever. Uh, but I went around the tires uh, on all of the cars that I was responsible for maintaining at the college over there. And there was an 03 Crown Victoria that had tires on it that weren't that old. They, they were really still good tires and they were all bought at the same time. And I pulled the number on every one of those tires and put it in that app. One of those tires had a, uh, had a recall on it. Just one of the four. They were all both the same, all the same kind of tire bought at the same time from the same tire shop. But one of them had a recall on it. That's useful information. All right. Uh, now, where can you get that information now? I don't know, because I know that uh, that app that I had, and that's the reason I'm not telling you what the app was. That app that I had uh, went offline. It got to where I mean, I don't know if they got some issues with uh, being sued or whatever. I don't know what their deal was, what the circumstances were. But they they took that offline. But you you can actually find that information online if you know where to go. So you might want to root around and dig into that. So this stuff more important than you think it is. Now this right here is a little cross-section deal. That you've seen some of this stuff probably before in other similar formats. Now this tire is 75% as tall as it is wide. That's what the aspect ratio is all about. R means radial, 15 means it's 15 inch diameter tire, so on and so forth. Most tires on cars now or, you know, 18, 19, 20, 22, you know, and usually on a full-size vehicle, you won't have anything smaller than a 17-inch tire on there anymore. Um, 92 load index. H is the speed rating. If you basically looked at all of the numbers on there, like I just put those numbers up there to play with. And there's your section height. See, that's 150. It's interesting to me that your section height and your width of the tires in millimeters, but the rim is in uh, inches. <laughs> it's kind of they kind of mix and match there. Uh, so that's basically how you figure that out. That's what these numbers here mean: 20575 or 15. So it's 205 millimeters wide, and it's 75 percent as tall as it is wide. That's why if you have if this number is lower, the tire will basically be wider. Is what it basically amounts to. Uh, just by, by default, you know, if you can play with those numbers, you see what I'm talking about. All right, your speed rating is really important. It's a measurement of speed at which it's designed to run for extended periods of time. Now, if you exceed the speed rating, the tire won't blow up right away, but it might if it's running at that speed for a long time. That's one of the things. Police radials are rated for a higher speed than regular car tires. There was a this guy that was a, wore a, he was wearing an Alabama State Trooper uniform. And on the patch on his shoulder, it said uh, Alabama State Trooper, Trooper Revenue Enforcement. And what his job was, was he would go with this little portable scales and he would weigh these trucks and make sure they weren't too heavy. He'd just randomly stop trucks that he thought might be overloaded and he'd weigh those things. And then they'd have to pay a ticket if they were loaded too heavy and all that. That was his job. And he had a, a gray Crown Victoria. Okay, so he says... Uh, uh, he came to me one day, and I, now his uniform looked slightly different than a regular trooper's uniform. His uniform was not dark blue with a light blue, I mean, not gray pants and a dark blue shirt. It was sort of a, a, a royal blue or, a, or a, sort of a muted royal blue pants and shirt, with, but he still had to take trooper badge and patches and all that. And I was at a dealership, and he says, my car won't go at about 100 miles an hour, and, I, and it's, it, you know, I think there's something wrong with it. And uh, so I said, well... I don't mind driving at 100 miles an hour, but I want you to be with me because I don't want to get pulled over because they just thought I was speeding from the front of it. So he said, okay, so we headed up this road, four-lane road. It was long and straight where there wasn't a lot of traffic. And uh, I was getting up around 100 miles an hour. I think it was like a 90, I mean, like a, uh, I'm trying to think, probably a 90 model car in front of or 91 because it was the old body style, not the, not the doer body style if eventually did away with. Anyhow, I got it going up that road about 100 miles an hour. He's sitting in the seat next to me over there. 
were all seat belted in. And he says, be careful when you go over this next hill because sometimes there'll be a trooper sitting up here. And I'm thinking, what? You know, I mean, I mean, I could get a ticket even driving this fast with you. I mean, this guy was, but it turned out that that guy's car was not a police interceptor. It was just a plain old Crown Victoria. Well, the fact that it wasn't a police interceptor meant that his tires wouldn't have handled over 100 miles an hour for very long anyway. If you go to Walmart, too, for example, and, you're, and you've got one of these 140 mile an hour Mustangs or whatever, they will not put tires on that Mustang that won't handle the speed that car is capable of. And that makes some people mad. But they, if they put the wrong tires on it and it blows out because they put the wrong tires on it, Walmart's going to have to eat it. And that's one of the reasons they're smart enough to know not to put tires on there that won't handle the speed the car is rated for. It's really important. All right, so basically your W means it's rated to, down here, 168 miles an hour, see. Um, but if you, the farther down you go with that alphabet down there along S, it's like 112. See that? Now here you've got your load index. The tire load index is a measurement of how much weight each tire is designed to support. And it goes to be divided, you know, between the front and the back of each tire. The larger the number, the higher the load capacity. Find out what 95 means, you got to look it up on load carrying capacity per tire chart online. Now I would have pulled that up on the screen, but it is very, very, very long. I mean, this is a very long, you'd have to put it up there in stages. There's no, no point in that. But a 95 indicates the maximum weight of 1,520 pounds per tire, which means you've got to multiply by 4 to get the total capacity for a complete set. All right, make them last a little longer. They put these anti ozonates in the rubber. Well, the anti ozonates in the rubber came into use just before 1970. Ozone is O3, but what anti ozonates do over time is, and it's not the same with every tire, I don't know why, it starts turning the tires brown. And when it starts turning these tires brown, you cannot wash that off of there. Some people complain about that. Once it interacts with the ozone and the ambient air, the oxidation turns the tire brown. The technical term for that is blooming. And you've seen that. Just about everybody's seen brown tires, you assumed it was dirt on there. But it's basically the tires blooming. That's what that is. Now, if you want to notice the underinflation tread wear, that's underinflation tread wear, you know, because the center is, you know, dipped in because of the way you're sitting on it. Overinflation tread wear, tread wear means it's out. Now, look at this. You can have this thing half flat, and it still looks pretty well aired up. So you can't really go by just looking at the tire. Uh, if you get pretty good at it, you can look at it and tell, and you can kick it and kind of tell when it, you know, if you're, even if you don't have your tire gauge with you, you can kick it and tell when it's a little bit low on air sometimes. Depends on the tire and the car and your boot and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but basically, it's an awfully good idea to keep that pressure checked. Now, what you go by, once again, I have seen this doggone thing. I've known, this is on every car just about. I've seen some cars where you'd have to go to the passenger side rear door and open it to find this daggum thing. But on most of them, when you open the driver's door, it's right in that area. And so you can typically find that. It'll tell you the tire size it's supposed to go on the car that it came with. And it also, it'll even tell you that what size the spare is supposed to be. How much pressure is supposed to go in the spare. This is where it's got a donut, so it has 60 pounds behind that arrow that you can't see. All right, and so right here, you got 32 PSI. And it gives it to you in kilopascals, too, in case you're one of those people that wants to measure it that way. And you're not going to get that information for your tire inflation pressure here. You're going to get it from here. Notice this, 32 is liable to be a lot different from 50. And so you don't want to put too much pressure in there. You'll have overinflation wear. Always check the tire pressure before doing an alignment. TPS systems don't always give tire pressure. The one on my pickup doesn't. It just turns on a light. Uh, and it's got those tire pressure monitors that are banded to the rim. You know, they're not there at the... Um, the valve stem. The, uh, my wife's truck though will tell her how much pressure is in each and every tire. So that's really important information that you can get right from your instrument cluster if you have that. Uh, the, uh, my Explorer, it doesn't tell me how much is in each tire. The good thing about that is you can rotate the tires on my pickup or my Explorer and you don't have to worry about where the, uh, you know, different sensors are. Uh, this uh, 08 Impala that we used to send over to a tire store, well, at the, when, 
the college in the other town, that campus is where that car was based, and they would send it to a tire store over there. Every time they rotated the tires, they have the they wouldn't go to the trouble to tell the system which tire was where, and so you see, with one tire was getting low, and you try to put air in that tire, and you find out you're putting air in a different tire. So they didn't know which tire was which. Uh, that's one of the things that you got to remember when you're rotating tires. Does that vehicle have a system that tells it which tire is where? Uh, because there's a system on every, and they're all different. And it seems to me like if they would make, you know, since TPMS is required now, it seems like all of them ought to have the same protocols for setting this thing up. Now, some tires, I mean, some vehicles, like on the uh, some of the Toyotas and some of the early Fords, I mean, like a, uh, in the 00s, like 07, some of the Toyotas just use measured rolling speed of the tire. Because if the tire's going low on air, it'll be like a smaller wheel and roll faster. And uh, Windstar, early Windstar did that too, because they, did, they, did, they didn't need any sensors in them. Then they started putting tire pressure monitor sensors in all of them. And, you know, uh, the guy at the tire store down here that I know really well, uh, I don't know if you've seen this Malco truck that comes around selling hand cleaner and shop supplies and all that. That Malco guy actually sells these universal tire pressure monitor sensors and he, he's got a tool that you can use to reset those things. It's just cool as all get out. The sensors don't cost very much and they work really well. <laughs> it's pretty slick. Although I have bought tire pressure monitor sensors from the parts store uh, that even though they were reading the right Hertz reading and all that, the, the system wouldn't like them and wouldn't talk to them. You know, it's just one of those annoying things about some of the electronics. Joey Henrik, he's the guy that is the, he owns AETools.us in Olaf, Kansas. This guy right here is a guru. If you need any help with any kind of programming or anything, he's the guy to call. The thing about it is if you buy stuff from AETools.us, he gives you free uh, support. And I used him for years. Uh, when I was buying tools at the college, I bought an IDS from him, and I bought a, a flash programmer from him, and I bought a, a you know, scan tools and all kinds of stuff. So when and he's got factory scan tools for every single one of them, he can actually log into your computer from where, or his people can, he can log into their, your computer from where you, remotely. You know, you got to give they give you a little code and you run this little routine. They can actually get in there and do the programming for you. If you're bogged down and you maybe you're familiar with Ford but not so much with Chrysler or maybe Volvo or something like that, they know how to do every last little bit of that and they're really, really good at it. And so this guy right here is a good fella to know. And uh, he's somebody, he's my go-to guy. He's the guy that there, I bought from AETools.us, I bought the BT-608 Altel tool that I got. But he sells other stuff besides Altel. He sells everything. If you want the GM factory tool, the Chrysler factory tool, the Ford factory tool, or he's got laptops that he's got partitioned so that you've got all of the software. I guarantee if you wanted to get the software, you know, and, and hook up for a Tesla, he could set you up with that too. All right. Never repair a tire that's worn below two thirty seconds of an inch. That's just a bad idea. Here's another one. Always pay attention to what you're doing. Every job is important, even if you're just hooking the chains to keep your trailer from getting away. That's actually a picture of what somebody did one time. A low-profile tire that has been running nearly flat on a Chrysler Crossfire. This lady came in there one time and she said, Hey, my tire pressure monitor light's on and I've driven all the way from such and such a town over here with my tires low. So she comes driving in there and one of my guys started trying to air the tire up to the specified and he got the thing about half of way to where it was supposed to be. You know, those Chrysler Crossfire have got really low profile OEM tires and it blew out the sidewall on the tire and she thought it was our fault. But the thing about it is if it's a low profile tire there's not a lot of bending that that thing can do. And it will, it, it's one of those things where if you're going to air up one that's been running almost flat you need to tell the customer these low profile tires will blow out if you're driving them almost flat for a long way then you try to air them up because they've already compromised the belts in the sidewall. Never repair tires with tread punctures larger than a quarter of an inch. I saw this picture online. I thought it was really funny. I don't know if that boy's just cleaning that tire up or if he's looking for a leak. But for some reason or another, he's not quite sure what he's doing. 
Uh, of course, he doesn't have on any safety glasses, so he may just be cleaning the tire, but I thought that was a funny picture. But if the tires have got tread punctures larger than a quarter of an inch, don't even try to fix them. Such a boat not supposed to be. Of course, everybody's done that, you know. When we plug the tire, you know, I, how many times you've had to plug a tire? You plug a tire in a parking lot, that can be a dead good workout. You know, it, it just... It's just, and sometimes when you're in a really, really big hurry and you're just trying to, you know, get the thing going again, you don't have time to break it down, put a plug in, a patch in there. Uh, you can, you know, jab a plug in it. It may drive for a long time like that without a problem. But they, these here plugs like that, that that actually go through there. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that no uh, water and stuff gets in there where the steel belts are, because if that happens, it'll compromise the steel belts. And they may start to. You know, move around and a tire may get to where it's doing the Watusi when you're driving along because the belts have separated. And that's not the only reason they separate, but that can cause that. So these ear plugs, it's got that stem on them. If you can basically enlarge that hole where this plug will go through there and then pull it, you know, they'll... Well, the ones that I have seen have got a little uh, thin aluminum uh, sheath on them so you can shove it through the hole and then pull that aluminum sheath off. And then you, it's glued on the inside, then it's glued in there too, and it, it does a lot better. Um, and when you get punctures in this area right here, you just don't need to, to fix those. Although, like I say, just about everybody that's ever worked on tires has done that. You know, you just see what you can get away with a lot of the times. And although that can be unsafe, you know, because tires have a tendency to, if they fail suddenly, you're in big trouble. The maximum number of nail holes is limited to two per tire and they got to be separated by at least 15 inches. Uh, you know, like for example, this tire right here, if it had two nail holes, one right next to another, technically you're supposed to replace that tire because it's got two nail holes right next to one another. Uh, and I have basically seen other numbers on that, but these two nail holes are too close together. And, you know, like I say, that's pretty well compromise, compromise that tire. Uh, some of the rules of thumb, section repairs are not allowed. Look, somebody put patches on the outside of this one. Uh, that's an epic fail. But if, if you have, you know, if it's busted like that, uh, you know, you need to put a little eyes here, maybe a nose, and make it look like that's a mouth. <laughs> but that one there, it's time for that one to go. Uh, always put the new tires on the back if you're just replacing two of them. Uh, new tires, if you got new tires mounted on the front and tires that have got less tread on the back, you're liable to spin out and crash which on, I always thought for eons, I always thought that you needed to drive, I mean, put the new tires on the front so they'd cut the water. But the back ones can get on top of the water even if the front ones are cutting it good and you can spin out and crash. And so that's really important. Now, a lot of people will argue with you about that. Here's your new tires mounted on the rear. You know, you're going to be doing a lot better because this thing's not going to try to leave the road with you. This is kind of a picture of that. There's actually a Got a couple of video captures where they demonstrated this. They had tires that were had a lot less tread on the back than on the front, and they actually came around and it spun out of control on that car. But on this one, driving the same speed, it didn't. They put the two new tires on the rear on that one, and it doesn't matter whether it's front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, or what the road surface is, whether it's snow, ice, rain, dry, whatever. Now, when, even when rotating your tires, you need to be aware that tires with the best tread should always go on the rear. So you can actually get yourself in trouble by ignoring if you got tires that are getting really worn thin in the front and you're trying to you want to move the back ones to the front and put the crappy front tires in the back that are just about wore out. That's a bad idea because you can have to call somebody to crash like that too. Now this is the only right answer. According to Ron uh, Morganona, uh, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, Senior Technical Marketing Manager for Michelin, the two new tires should always be placed on the rear axle and the older tires move to the front. That's been proven on test tracks and labs. It's all about oversteer and understeer and the physics of the vehicle center of gravity. So when two tires, new tires have been installed on the rear, the recommended rotation is you go side to side instead of front to rear. See? Older mechanics will argue with you about this. They will beat their head against the wall. They'll tell you, you're wrong for all these years. I've done it this way. This way I'm going to keep doing it. But I'm telling you, the OEM people, if you look up online, every one of these tire manufacturers are going to tell you to put new tires on the back and put the ones that aren't so new on the front. The manufacturers talk about that all the time. Lawsuits have been lost by shops that put the best ones on the front and millions of dollars have been awarded to accident victims 
because whenever these uh, people, I'm going to tell you something that I saw one time that I thought was very interesting. There was, we had a bunch of Plymouth Valari automobile thing. I remember this is way back before 1980 at the uh, place where I was working down there. The company cars that the salespeople drove were Valari, Plymouth Valaris, if you know what that is. Okay, so this one character, uh, and I, I knew for a fact that he was a kind of a shyster, uh, he had a, his wife drove a Plymouth Valari that was exactly the same model as the one he was driving as his sales car. Okay, so you got to also remember that at this period in time, radial tires were just becoming a thing. There were still a lot of cars out there that had bias ply tires uh, as well as radials on them. So you might find bias ply or radial tires on, you know, the same car. In other words, the same year model car could have either bias ply or radial tires because they were, you know, they were both kind of in play back then. And these radial tires were a lot better than bias ply tires, obviously. Uh, but the point is, uh, he was driving that car for a while, you know, and he even made some noise about how the tires on his company car was better than the tires on his wife's car. And he made some kind of a noise about swapping out the tires. And I just told him, you better not do that. But uh, the car that he had been driving was a green one. And it was sold to this lady that was one, that worked in the office. Uh, she bought one of the company, you know, bought that nice little Bellari. And so she was driving it downtown in Port Arthur. And all of a sudden, she lost control of that thing on a straight road. And it turned around and in traffic got hit by three or four cars and it tore it all to pieces. And um, so the executive vice president sent me down there and said, go see what's going on with that car. What, maybe if you can see what happened. Because she said she was just driving straight and she went to stop and it started swapping ends with her in the road and all. And so I went down there and I looked at the car and on the left front was a radial and on the left rear was a bias ply tire. We didn't leave it like that. That guy had swapped the best tires off of her car onto his car and vice versa. And he had put two bias ply tires on her car. So she had radials on the left front and the right rear and bias ply tires on the left rear and right front. And so she was driving on pavement that was a little bit slippery, I guess, maybe misty or whatever. And when she hit the brake, that, you know, it just caused the car to go into a spin. Uh, and it was just, it was nasty, you know, and it, it just tore the thing all to pieces. It's kind of like that, when I was talking about brakes, that uh, Cajun guy named T-Boy, uh, he had a Chevrolet pickup that had uh, drum brakes all the way around, and he had put uh, the long shoes, you know, he got a long and a short, you know, on the dual servo, he put the long shoes on the left front and the uh, short shoes, I mean, as the left front and right rear, he put the long shoes, because they all looked alike to him, and then he put the short shoes on the right front and the left rear. And <laughs> he didn't have an accident, but he came and he told David Hughes at the parts store, he goes, when I hit the brakes on my truck, I go back where I come from. <laughs> and he was swapping in in the road because of the way the brakes were, because of the way he put the brake shoes on. And it was, like I say, it was four-wheel drum brake. So, anyhow, always use, check the torque specs, and use a torque wrench or torque stick so lug nuts when reinstalling a tire. A lot of people just blow that out. I used to teach my students to always torque them with a torque wrench. We could have had some torque sticks. Those things are pretty pricey. And they use those at the tire store down the road here, which is fine, you know, as long as you pick the right ones. Um, the, I did think it was interesting that the, the torque on my uh, pickup truck, that, that six lug pickup on my 07F150, 150 foot pounds per lug nut, and they used the big blue one on that one right there. And I was thinking, you know, if you're going to use that one, you know, you, I mean, and furthermore, how do you know how strong your impact wrench? Once you put that on there, how, your impact wrench better be stronger than 150 foot-pounds if it's going to torque up to 150 foot-pounds using that torque stick. I mean, this torque stick's pretty good, but I mean, I'm, I'm more comfortable with torquing it with a torque wrench personally. You know, click, click, click. A lot of people just say, well, we're going to, we just go ahead and we've done this for all these years, never had a problem. All that, you know, of course, sometimes I've seen it where it stretched the lug, uh, the threads on it, and you go to take it off, and the stupid thread, the thing's galled, and the lug nut won't come off. That's a pain. But uh, anyway, that's all I got for you today. And uh, until next time, I will see you guys later.